Hello, everyone. Welcome to Psychology of Role-Playing Games. This is part two of my three-part series on problem solving. If you haven't checked out part one yet, I recommend going back and checking that out. Today, we're going to be building on some of those concepts that we talked about in part one. And ultimately, that's going to lead us to our final third part, which is going to be about building better problems for our role-playing games. Now, what do I mean by problems? I'm talking about problem solving. Problem solving is sort of a form of decision making. We make hundreds of decisions every single day. Problem solving is just a unique form of decision making because there's something in our way, some obstacle that we need to overcome. That could be sometimes literally a physical obstacle that we have to overcome, but oftentimes it's things like time. Time is an obstacle that we have to overcome because we only have so much of it and we have to decide what to do with the time that we have. Now, problem solving is typically broken up into two categories, well or ill-defined problems. Last time we talked, we talked mostly about well-defined problems, which are those problems that have very clear restraints, very clear rules, and a very clear goal that you're shooting towards. It's nice and clean. It's easy to work with. Because it's easy to work with, you can go through that sort of effortful process that I described in part one, that five-step model for decision-making. Ill-defined problems are a little bit different. We start to feel ill about a problem when either the goal is unclear, you don't actually know what the final state looks like, or the rules are unclear or nebulous or give you too much room for flexibility. You can have both of these. You can have a problem that has no clear goal and no clear rules, it's still technically a problem, but that's really more of a nightmare than anything else. A good ill-defined problem oftentimes has clear rules, but a goal that you have to figure out, or a goal that you know for sure you need to hit, but you don't exactly know how you're going to get to that goal. And what's allowed and not allowed is maybe open to interpretation. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Let me show you some examples of ill-defined problems. This is the classic nine-dot problem. Uh, it's a very old problem. It's an old puzzle, essentially, that we use now a lot in cognitive psychology to talk about ill-defined problem solving. What you need to do with this task is with four continuous straight lines, without lifting up your pencil, connect all nine dots. And what I want you to do is I want you to pause this video, draw it out on a piece of paper, draw your nine dots, and practice this. See if you can, in four lines, connect all four. And I think that you're going to find that if you haven't done this before, if you haven't seen this problem before, this is actually much more difficult than it sounds. I mean, let's just think about what you might start doing. You might start in the upper left corner, go across, then go down, and then go across again, and then go up. That's four lines, but all you've done is made a square. You've missed the middle dot, right? You need to go through all nine of them. So feel free to pause this video. Feel free to play along and, and see if you can figure it out. And when you're ready, let me show you what the answer is. This is the answer to the nine dot problem. And it kind of gives us an idea of where that phrase, think outside the box, comes from. You solve the nine dot problem by literally thinking outside the realm or the box in which you were given to work. See, it wasn't actually very fair of me. In the previous picture, I gave you like a clearly constrained box. The white background, the dots go all the way to the edge of it. One would be, it would be fair for you to think, I've got to work in the constraints of this box. This is the rules that Spencer has given me. But an ill-defined problem oftentimes requires us to either reinterpret the rules or break the rules in order to solve them. In this case, I never actually explicitly said you can't think outside the space of the nine dots. That's why this is an ill-defined problem. You don't really know what the goal looks like. You know what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be nine dots connected by four lines, but you don't know exactly how you're supposed to get there. And here's how you do it. As you can see, the lines need to be drawn outside the kind of perimeter of the nine dots. If you can do that, you've solved the problem. Oftentimes, people solve this problem by looking at it, and then suddenly it just hits them. Let me give you another example of this. These are matchstick problems. These are what we call matchstick insight problems. Uh, this is a math problem written out with matchsticks, little cartoon matchsticks here, that are um, describing a math problem in Roman numerals. So if you're not familiar with Roman numerals, right now it says 
4 equals 3 plus 3. That's incorrect, right? That's not a true math problem. These problems, the goal is to make a true math problem by moving one matchstick. So how is this an ill-defined problem? The rules are actually very clear. You only get to move one matchstick. You can move it anywhere, but you only get to move one. That's relatively constrained. But what's unconstrained here or what's unclear is the goal. A true math problem? We know that there's an infinite number of true math problems. So what exactly does a true math problem look like here? Well, you're probably looking at this and thinking, okay, how do we make this happen? What can I move in order to make this a true math problem? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Feel free to pause again. But here's the answer. That leftmost stick there, the, the I before the V, if you just move that to the other side of the V, we turn 4 into 6, and 6 does equal 3 plus 3. That's one way to solve this problem. There's actually another way of solving it. You could take any of the matchsticks and put them diagonally across the equal sign, and suddenly you have some variable or some version of something not equaling another thing. Let's take that same uh, I that I mentioned before the, the V and turn it into a not equal sign. Well, five does not equal three plus three. That is technically a mathematically true solution. So now we know a trick. Let me show you another one of these. Looking at this problem, well, you've already solved one problem using that trick, so you know that's gonna work again, right? We could definitely pick up one of those sticks and make a not equal sign and solve this again. But how else could we solve this solution? or solve this problem, you, you would stare at it, you'd look at it for a little while, and now that you know we can work on the operators, it doesn't have to just be the numbers, you might start to think, well, what else could I do? That plus sign, what if we turned that up and down stick sideways? Now we have three equals three equals three, a true math problem. What are these examples of? Well, they're ill-defined problems, like I said, because in this case, the goal is really unclear. Mathematically true problem, way too vague. But the rules are clear. Move one matchstick. Maybe it wasn't intuitive to you that you could use the matchsticks that are related to the operators or mess with the operators rather than just the numbers, but the rules were pretty straightforward. The goal was unclear. These are all examples of insight problems. They are marked by a solution where you go, aha, I know how to solve this problem. There's no obvious path to these things. They just kind of hit you. It's that eureka moment. The thing with insight problems is that once you solve one, solving the next one becomes a little bit easier and a little bit easier, right? If you knew that you could mess with the operators because you messed with them over here, then from now on, solving these matchstick problems is going to be easy because you know that's always a solution you could use. So what do ill-defined problems look like in RPGs? Why would we ever use a problem that's not solvable or obviously solvable. They actually occur much more frequently than we think. These are problems in which even the GM, assuming you have a sort of a traditional dynamic of GM and players, doesn't have the answer to, right? They've just proposed an interesting scenario, an interesting obstacle in front of the players and said, figure it out. The GM has no idea what's going on. They have a sense of maybe how it could be solved, but maybe they don't. This is a vague problem, and the players just attack it from multiple angles until it feels like it's been solved, until everybody goes, oh, that seems to make sense, or until the GM so, uh, recognizes a solution and goes, yeah, that's close enough. Let's go with that, right? Where do we see these things? Flip to, honestly, any OSR module or any adventure module that is kind of meant for a it's, it's system agnostic, and you're going to see tons and tons of problems like this. System agnostic adventure modules and things like that need to be ill-defined problems because you can't write about mechanical solutions. And so they're the sorts of things that you just are supposed to invite our players to tinker with until they find the solution. So what is actually going on when a player is solving the, these things? Well, part of it is heuristics, which we talked about back in part one. They think back to, have they ever solved something like this before? Have they ever been in a similar situation before? Using whatever available information is around them and their previous experience, they can hopefully use some sort of shortcut. Otherwise, your RPG session is going to run into sort of a dead stop. 
as the players go, well, I have no idea what the hell we're supposed to be doing. And the GM also has no idea what the hell is supposed to be going on. And now we all have to sit here awkwardly and go, oh, how is this actually fixed? How is this actually solved? Now, that doesn't actually happen too often. And there are ways around this. And I'll talk in a future video about how we can solve these sort of insight problems and the unique things going on in our mind when we, when we do this sort of thing. But we'll save that for a future video. So I mentioned in the, the first part that I was also going to tell you about problem-solving strategies in this video. So we've got ill-defined problems, and it sounds like there's not a whole lot of strategic thinking to it. So where do we see strategic problem-solving? We see it in our well-defined problems. Let's start with two examples. Remember that example I used in the first episode where we're talking about your ally, they've been wrongly accused of a crime, they're being held, and they're going to eventually be judged by the queen. You want to help this ally, all right? So we're back to this problem set uh, again. We talked about how to solve that with sort of the five-step Galati model of decision-making. Today, we're going to talk about how to solve it with three different strategies, or maybe how some of those strategies are more important or relevant than others. I also want to talk about it in terms of this thing over here. This is the Tower of Hanoi problem. It's a puzzle that we use a lot in cognitive psychology. I mentioned it in the introduction video a long time ago. It's basically a simple task where you need to move those three disks on the leftmost peg to the rightmost peg with a few rules in place. Specifically, you can only move the topmost disk at a time, and you can't put a bigger disk on top of a smaller disk. So you might already be looking at this puzzle and thinking about how you might solve it. Here's how a computer would solve it. Computers solve these problems algorithmically. They understand what we would call the problem space, which is all the possible avenues that you can take, all the possible routes that you could solve this thing. And it just burns through them and just cycles through all of the possible solutions until it figures it out. In this case, there is a path that it can follow. It might be a little bit hard to see, but the arrows beneath each of these states are either red and black. The red arrows are showing us the solution sort of path to take. Right away in the initial state, you've got two options. You either move that red disc all the way to the right, or you move it to the middle peg. And then from there, you spread and spread and spread. And we could try and map all that out in our heads, but that would be exhausting. That's why we let computers do it algorithmically. We could also try and think about every possible scenario when we're trying to solve our friend from the queen and the wrongful accusation of crime, but that would be exhausting. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. I've played plenty of Shadowrun campaigns and sessions where this exact scenario happens, where we think about every possible avenue, every route that could happen until we think we have the only one way that's going to work out for us. Of course, it never actually does, but we try and represent this algorithmic thinking oftentimes in games that highly kind of elevate that idea of prep. So let's talk about strategies. There's three that I want to talk about. The first one is the means end strategy. This is basically just a sort of a constant check-in with yourself. You're comparing how you currently are to where you want to be. And remember, good decision-making is always about moving closer to the goal. So if your current state is closer than you were before, you're on the right track. You just need to keep moving in that direction. It's all about making sub-goals, small goals that are attainable, things that you know that you can handle in bite-sized pieces that are still moving you in that direction towards the goal state. As long as you're moving towards it, then the means and strategy is working out for you. For the Tower of Hanoi, that's making sure that you're constantly moving disks towards the right side. Now we know with the Tower of Hanoi, you actually have to do some backtracking, which means the mean, the mean end strategy doesn't always work out for us. But largely it's about setting sub goals. And right now at the Tower of Hanoi, our sub goal is to move that big bottom disk all the way to the bottom on the right side. Once we've got that set up, it's just a matter of getting the other two disks there. What about saving our ally from the queen? What are the sub goals that we can set up along the way? Well, it kind of depends on what our general approach is. If we're gonna be doing something diplomatic, something social, we might need to talk our way into the queen's court in the first place. We probably can't assume we could just go talk to the queen. So a sub goal would be get access to the queen's court. And then we think about what needs to happen there. Once we've accomplished that, we know we're closer to our goal. The second strategy is the brute force strategy. It's hill climbing. Who has time for sub goals? Who has time for all this thinking and comparisons? 
The hill climbing strategy is move from the fastest, most direct path from point A to point B. Don't even try and think about the other paths along the way. Those are just distractions from your direct and immediate approach towards the goal. In a small problem space, one where there's not a lot of options, not a lot of branching paths, hill climbing is especially useful. In situations where you have actually a more complex spread, it's not so great. Let's think back to the Tower of Hanoi. It's a relatively simple problem, but as you saw that sort of spiderweb space, the problem space itself is complex. That wasn't even a complete picture of the entire problem space. The hill climbing approach here would be move the smallest disc all the way to the right peg. Why would that be the thing? Because that's the closest thing that resembles the final end state. If you move it to the middle, well, that's not what you want. None of the discs are supposed to be in the middle. They're all supposed to be on the right side. So move it to the right. It's all about moving this as far to the right as legally possible according to the rules. What does that mean in terms of our RPGs? This is for those games that are not about prep, right? If they have any kind of prep component to them, the prep is all about how do we do this as fast and quickly as possible. You know, it's going to get messy along the way. Going back to our, our comparison between Shadowrun and Blades in the Dark, Blades in the Dark is much more of a hill climbing based game because you just start halfway up the hill, right? You start with an engagement roll and you're already climbing. They're not thinking about putting together your gear and thinking about what you're going to wear and where you're going to go and where you're going to be. You're just in it right away. And once you're in it, you've got that momentum and you just keep riding that momentum. The last strategy I want to talk about is working backwards. And this is really only a useful strategy if the goal is clear, you know what the end goal looks like, and if it's a sort of sequential problem space, if there's a clear step-by-step -step sort of thing. If there's a clear sequential sort of step-by-step -step thing, then all you need to do is imagine the goal state and imagine the step just before that. And if you can imagine what that step looks like, you can imagine the step before that and the step before that, and the step before that. And eventually you've just done the problem backwards to beginning rather than beginning to end. Again, it's really only a useful strategy if you know what your goal is and it's sequential. It's not enough just to know what the goal is because if the sequence isn't obvious, if there's no step-by-step, -step, you don't know what the step just before the goal looks like. Right now with our problem space of our ally being held uh, falsely accused, we actually don't know what the step just before that looks like because we haven't really decided, are we going to try and talk our way out of this? Are we going to do a prison break scenario? Are we abandoning our ally? We haven't really considered any of these things. And so we really can't use the working backwards strategy with this sort of scenario because the sequence isn't obvious. In fact, I honestly think that working backwards is the least useful strategy in RPGs. I'm not saying it's impossible to use, I think it's really helpful in games that, again, have that very clear, heavy emphasis on prep, but even then, it's not always going to work for us. So let's wrap up part two of problem solving here. We've learned that ill and well-defined problems have different approaches to them. Well-defined problems have some strategies that we could use, but they also use that very effortful and time-consuming five-step process that I talked about that Galati mapped out in 2002. Ill-defined problems well, right now, we actually don't really know how to solve them. We just know that they get solved, right? Because you just poke at it and poke at it and poke at it until it just fixes itself, until you just know what the answer is, until you have that aha moment. Again, we'll talk more in a future video about how we can get to that aha moment. But for now, let's think about these two problem types. They are more appropriate in some games than others. Again, Shadowrun is one of those games that lends itself to well-defined problem spaces. It's good to have clear rules. In fact, it's a very rule-heavy game. Any game that has a very strong emphasis on rules and balance are going to lend themselves to well-defined problems because there are mechanical means by which the players can solve those problems. If a game is relatively light on mechanics or doesn't sit in a space where you are supposed to be prepping and thinking things out too much, then we're in the space where actually ill-defined problems might be more interesting for the players and the table to work with. That might be something that's fun for them to tinker with and play with until they find the solution. 
Okay, so we now know that we have two types of problems, ill and well-defined problems. In our third part, the final part of this series, I'm going to talk about how we can use what we've learned in these first two parts to build good, ill, and well-defined problems for our role-playing games, regardless of the system that you use, regardless of the play style that you have. There's a perfect way to think about each of these problems and incorporate them into your game. So that wraps up part two. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you enjoyed it, let me know. Uh, there are comments below. Feel free to drop a comment on what you think or if you have a question. If you also have a question and you don't want to leave a comment, you can always reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Gila RPGs. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. I look forward to talking to you more about psychology soon. Bye.